Until their expulsion in 1767, the Jesuits radically transformed the ecosystem of the oasis. But how did these men from the other side of the globe manage to create a sustainable community in the desert? The question has fascinated a group of researchers in Baja California. They are led by Aurora Braceda. For the past 15 years, this biologist has been retracing the history of this oasis. She is convinced we have much to learn about its past. When the Jesuits arrived, they discovered a very wild oasis, covered with palm trees, a little like you see here. They had to start from scratch to produce food and set up the mission. They had to transform this place and make it viable for agriculture. It was a huge undertaking, a titanic effort which they repeated in all the oases on the peninsula. To gauge the scale of transformations carried out by the Jesuits, Aurora goes back in time by investigating the plants. We are going to count how many we have of the same species. 40. And the other one? The aim is to record in a square 10 meters by 10 all the species of tree, shrub and other plants within that perimeter. That provides a sample of the vegetation. We have to repeat the operation to gain a good representation of the whole ecosystem. Fernando, let's measure this plant, its maximum height. Start here if you would. Thanks to this survey process, Aurora made an astonishing discovery. More than one third of the plants recorded are not indigenous to the continent. The Jesuits therefore introduced most of the cultivable species, like the date palm. Until the missionaries arrived, there was only the Washingtonia palm, the endemic species in this part of America. The Jesuits came from Spain. They already had knowledge of oasis culture, thanks to influences from the Middle East. They brought with them the date palm, a resistant species that can grow here and which produces a lot of fruit. In fact, when one thinks of an oasis, the image of a date palm immediately comes to mind. Among other imports from the Mediterranean basin are the vines grown today by Ernesto. His rootstock is the oldest on the North American continent. Most of the fruits growing here are familiar to us. Mm. Mm. Buenísimo. Delicious. Here we can see a magnificent fig tree. It was brought here by the Jesuits to be cultivated along with olive trees and fruit trees, which give this land a Mediterranean feel. Wow, what an amazing cactus. We're in an arid zone after all. The desert is ever-present. These orchards are the Jesuits' legacy. Today, they are the symbol of Los Comandú. Each family has its own garden, like Virgilio Perpoli. Here is a very sweet grapefruit, a pomelo. Here we have avocados. We also have bananas. 
This is a royal lemon. It's still green. They're very popular here and are only found in Baja, California. It'll be even bigger when it's ripe. This is a little forgotten paradise. I compare it to the world described by the writer Fernando Jordan. He spoke of a Shangri-La. He said all that was missing is a river of milk, since everything else grows here. These gardens mean every family can feed themselves year-round on a self-sufficient basis. Here are my avocados. I can make five or six thousand pesos in a season. But the main thing they provide me with is health, physical and mental health. It's as if all this gives me energy. They're organic and full of flavor. They're even better with a pinch of salt. With a tortilla, it makes the best breakfast. I'm nearly 83 and still going strong. Without those orchards, Los Comondu would not be the same. And everyone who's living depends on harvesting these fruits or the sale of sweet products would die. The Jesuits did not only lay out these gardens, they also built a whole irrigation network like those found in North Africa. They transformed sandy and rocky beds into terraces for agriculture. The system of gardens set up by the missionaries is very stratified, with various types of crops in the orchards. For example, there you have sugarcane, and above that, fruit trees. These arrangements took a lot of work. The whole natural environment was altered for this cultivation. It's actually the first form of agriculture in the Californias. It was here that California was born. It was then the hand of man which shaped Los Comandú. But this miracle would remain a mirage without the presence of water. But where does it come from? To find out, you don't have to look at the ground, but at the high peaks, towards the Sierra de la Giganta, the mountain range which rises to 1,176 meters right above Los Comandú. Hydrogeologist Miguel La Madrid is a specialist in high altitude lakes, thought to be the water reserves of the oasis. Here in Los Comundo, the water comes from the peaks. When it rains, mainly in the summer, the rain falls and accumulates in these lakes. This one is located at an altitude of 500 meters. This is a characteristic that is not found in other oases around the world, where the water comes from the phreatic table. That's why I like to say you have to climb to see where the water comes from here.
We're going to test the water quality we have here around the oasis. I'll take a water sample. At first glance, we see that it's cloudy, which is due to organic matter. Now, I'm going to measure the physical and chemical parameters. I can determine the salinity of the water, and it's evident that the water looks really salty. We have a reading approaching 1,100 microsiemens per centimeter. The salinity goes up when the water is stagnant. In Baja California, we have an arid climate with temperatures above 40 degrees in summer. The rate of evaporation is very high. And that means the water becomes more salty. The presence of salt confirms that a significant volume of surface water quickly evaporates due to the high temperatures. But why doesn't the water evaporate completely? And how does it reach the oasis below? Miguel continues his exploration in the canyons above Los Comondú. The secret of the water supply to the oasis can be found in this rock. This rock we have here is basalt. As you can see, it's very hard. But it contains cavities. This porosity was formed when the lava was a liquid. It contained a lot of gas, and those gases formed pockets. The fissures that grow out of these pockets play a key role in feeding the aquifer system. As such, the rainwater which accumulates in the lakes infiltrates into all these holes before ultimately arriving below and feeding the rivers of the oasis. This basalt rock formed some 10 million years ago in the Sierra de la Giganta, when these now extinct volcanoes erupted. The oases of Baja California formed along the former lava flows, which became basalt rock. This basalt is present in the whole canyon system which surrounds Los Comondú characterized by symmetrical columns shaped by the movement of tectonic plates. Nature here is an unrivaled architect. These rocks look like a cathedral. Or, you might say, the pipes of an organ in a church. These natural monuments in porous rock constitute a vast water tower. If we didn't have this water storage system in the fractured rock, the water which accumulates on the high plateaus would end up evaporating and there wouldn't be a drop below. The oasis would not be permanent, but seasonal, or it might even disappear. Nature is truly ingenious. The hydrogeologists work has revealed the pathway of the waters of Los Comondú. When rain falls in the mountains, it collects in the high altitude lakes. The part exposed to the air will evaporate, but a proportion of this water infiltrates the porous rock. It remains stored inside these cliffs before slowly flowing into the oasis below. The water stored in the rock reappears on the surface through this resurgence process.
This oasis is incredible. Imagine that the water we touched up there at an altitude of 500 meters, several kilometers from here, filters through these rocks before re-emerging in this magical place. Water is life. That is the magic of this corner of southern Baja California. The aquifer system allows mankind to live in one of the world's most arid deserts, 